2 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in all Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is a familiar greeting among the letters of Paul. Paul starts off by introducing himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. I think this is both familiar and necessary. We should remind ourselves that Paul's apostolic credentials were under attack among the Christians in Corinth. Paul was the Rodney Dangerfield of the apostles there in the city of Corinth. He didn't get any respect from them. There were other disciples, other apostles, I should say, that they preferred, that they thought were more glamorous, more charismatic, more apostolic, if you will. Paul didn't wear the right kind of suits. He didn't project the right kind of image. He didn't have that preaching voice that they so valued in the other apostles. And Paul was a very humble, simple, direct man, and oftentimes not very impressive in his appearance or in his words. But nonetheless, he was an apostle, and he strengthens the point in this first verse by pointing out Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. What made Paul an apostle? Ladies and gentlemen, it was not the will or the decision or the desire of any man, including Paul himself. Paul didn't go to apostle school or apostle college and somehow try to get a degree in apostolic ministry. Paul was an apostle by the will of God. And friends, if the Corinthian Christians held the apostle Paul in low regard, it did not diminish his standing as an apostle before God. Just because the Corinthians weren't supportive and encouraging to Paul. God in heaven didn't look down upon Paul and say, well, maybe he isn't an apostle. It wasn't a popularity contest. But by the same token, if Paul will establish his apostolic credentials, he'll also establish the credentials of the Corinthians in the Lord. Did you notice this in verse 1? To the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in all Achaia. It's sort of remarkable that Paul freely calls the Corinthian Christians saints considering their many problems. This was a church that had a lot of problems, and we use the term saints in sort of a wrong way today, indicating somebody who's sort of super spiritual. But that's not the idea behind the Greek word uh, for saint here. It's simply somebody who has a relationship of trust in Jesus Christ. I find it also interesting that Paul intended that this letter go beyond just the city of Corinth. He's sending it to the whole region. If you notice there in verse 1, it says, With all the saints who are in all Achaia. He goes on, verse 2, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Again, a very typical greeting of the Apostle Paul. In all 13 of Paul's New Testament letters, he begins with this familiar greeting of grace and peace. And he begins it here and with verse 3, getting right into the subject. He says, verse 3, Blessed Be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. You know, there's two things present in verses 3 and 4. There's a lot of tribulation present, and there's a lot of comfort present. But notice the context. In verse 3, Paul begins by praising the God who has shown so much mercy and comfort to Paul. Paul can't seem to write more than a couple paragraphs in any of his letters without breaking out in praise to God. And Paul praises the God of this comfort because Paul knows the mercy and the comfort of God on a first-person basis. By the way, the word there for comfort is much more than the idea of soothing sympathy. A lot of times that's what we want, right? When we're hurting, when we're uh, needy. We want somebody just to come and give us that soothing sympathy. That's really not the idea behind the word that Paul is using here. Actually, the idea is much more of that of strengthening, of helping, of making strong. It's not just of stroking. It's not just of, well, there, there, uh, poor dear. It'll be much better. No, it's the idea of strengthening, of making somebody strong. And Paul's saying, listen, God has given us this comfort in our times of tribulation. Why? Did you see it there in verse 4? That we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. Now, one great purpose of God in comforting us is so that we can bring comfort to others. 
God's comfort can be given and received through other people. Now, think about that. And whatever trial, whatever tribulation you find yourself in your life right now, who knows if God has not allowed that to come into your life because at some later time, near or distant, God is going to bring somebody else across your path who needs to know exactly what you're learning from the Lord right now, and God is going to bring them comfort through you. That's exciting, isn't it? You think God can use me in that way? But let me draw the corollary point. Maybe you're a person who needs comfort. And you're thinking, well, you know, I'll just get it right from God. I don't want to ever tell anybody else my problem. And maybe there's some things in your life that are just between you and God. But I think generally speaking, there's a lot of things that we go through that we're just too proud to bring up with somebody else, right? And we miss out on the comfort God would bring us through somebody else because we never share our difficulties with somebody else. Friends, God gives us comfort so that we can comfort others. And Paul knew this in his life, and he's trying to encourage the Corinthians and us with that same idea. Friends, the picture's just bigger than you. It's bigger than me. It's not just all about us. The trials that you're going through right now, God has a purpose in them beyond you. God has a purpose in those trials for something bigger than just yourself. Now, Paul's going to continue on with this thought, beginning here at verse 5, where he says, For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we're comforted, it's for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast, because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will partake of the consolation. You know, the first few words of verse 5 are kind of stunning, aren't they? Paul just flat out comes to us and he says that the sufferings of Christ abound in us. You know what he means by that, don't you? Let's kind of take it out of Bible talk and lay it right down the line, more of the street talk. Paul suffered a lot. There was a large amount of suffering in Paul's life. You know, later on in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 23, Paul describes some of these sufferings. Let me just read that passage here. A stripes, prisons, beaten, stoned, shipwrecked, perils of waters, robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils of the city, in perils of the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil and sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst and fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Paul experienced a lot of suffering. I think of that list from 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and I think at the end he says, in cold. Do you you realize how many times Paul was just plain cold for the sake of the gospel? I mean, there he is traveling somewhere, getting from point A to point B. Friends, he didn't have that nice Gore-Tex down jacket that you have at home. You know, he he didn't have the car, the, the lousiest car you have with that broken down old heater. It's better than Paul ever rode in. You realize how many times Paul, just for the sake of being out there ministering gospel, was just chilled to the bone. And that was almost the least of his sufferings. Friends, Paul knew what it was like to have the sufferings of Christ abounding. And you read a list like this, you think of what Paul went through. Kind of puts your problems and my problems in perspective, doesn't it? We're almost ashamed about the way we whine about our things before God. We think of what the great men and women of God have gone through before us. Yet at the same time, look at what Paul says in verse 5. He says, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us. Paul knew that all his sufferings were really the sufferings of Christ. In other words, there was an arena of fellowship with Jesus Christ that was entered into through suffering. That Jesus was there sharing in the suffering. Now, verse 5, just the first part of it on its own would would be a pretty bleak Christian life. If we just read, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us and leave it there, it's it's pretty depressing, but why don't we just go on? So our consolation also abounds through Christ. 
You see, my friends, because Paul's sufferings were really the sufferings of Christ, Jesus was not distant from Paul in his trials. Jesus was right there identifying with the apostle. He was right there comforting Paul. You know how it is in the summertime when the day is really hot. The next day you go out and and there's dew all over the place. It's like the hotter the day, the more dew there is on the ground. Well, friends, the the hotter the time of trouble, the, the greater are the dews of refreshing from God. And you can count on it. When sufferings abound, consolation also abounds. Jesus is there to bring comfort if we will receive it. Now, might I add, though, that I think that this is only absolutely true. I mean, true as a unshakable promise of God. If we are not suffering, as Peter says, as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. You know, there's a lot of suffering that we just plain bring on ourselves. Oh, we might turn, oh, it's my cross to bear. Oh, I'm just suffering for the Lord. And God's saying, I have nothing to do with this one. This is all you. (laughs) You get the idea. I mean, there's some, some, we just bring it on ourselves. Friends, when our sufferings are in Christ, Jesus Christ is there. He's there to comfort. He's there to shore us up. That's why he says, our consolation also abounds through Christ. Did you notice the last couple words there of verse 5? Our consolation also abounds through Christ. Friends, let me be very direct in telling you that God may allow situations in your life where your only consolation is found through Christ. Now, you thought that consolation would come some other place. Consolation would come through a change in circumstances. Consolation would come through a change of friends, through a change of associates, through a change of jobs, through a change of winning the lottery, or a change of this or that. That's how consolation was going to come, right? Friends, I'm telling you, God will allow situations in your life where your only consolation will be in Jesus Christ. And sometimes we stand back and think, well, man, that's not fair. Gosh, God, you're being kind of mean, aren't you? I mean, that's my only consolation is in Jesus. But friends, it's the same idea what Jesus said in John chapter 16, where he said, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So where's your heart at when you're in one of those situations? Are you bitter about it? Are you whining before God? Are you just moaning before the Lord and saying, well, Lord, all you've given me to comfort me is Jesus. That's all you've given me. There's nothing else. And God says, yeah, right. Now you're getting the idea. And when you find the sufficiency of comfort and consolation that there is in Jesus Christ, what a revolution in your life. Friends, what can man do against you when you have that consolation in Jesus Christ? You're unshakable. You're a rock. It doesn't matter what people bring against you. Because nobody can take Jesus away from you, can they? Nobody can. Listen, your job, your house, your health, all the things around you, they can be taken away tomorrow. All of that stuff is uncertain with us. But Jesus will always be there. When you learn to find your consolation in Jesus Christ, it means that the source of comfort and consolation is always there. Now he continues on the thought. Look at here, verse 6. He says, Now, if we are afflicted, now Paul's speaking of the we as ministers, as the apostles, as those who were doing ministry unto the Corinthians. He says, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation. In other words, if Paul and other ministers were afflicted, it was for the sake of God's people. God had a larger purpose in Paul's suffering than just working on Paul himself. God was bringing consolation and salvation to others through Paul's sufferings. And we might, well, well, how could that work? I mean, how does Paul's consolation, how does Paul's suffering translate into consolation and and salvation for me or for you or for anybody? Well, it's not too hard to figure out. Suffering brought Paul closer to God, did it not? Suffering made Paul rely more and more on God, did it not? And as Paul relied more and more on God, it made him a more effective minister. And he was more usable by God to bring consolation and salvation to God's people. 
You know, God can use you the same way. How about this? You ever prayed a prayer like this? Lord, just use me. I just want to be used by you to touch the lives of other people. You ever prayed a prayer like that? Well, you didn't realize you were praying a dangerous prayer there, did you? You didn't realize that you were inviting God to bring suffering into your life. If that be the proper tool to make you more usable and more able to bring consolation and salvation to the lives of others. Lord, I want to be there to bring consolation to the lives of others. I want to be there to bring salvation to the lives of others. Well, fine, the Lord says, then we'll go through some suffering together. Oh, no, Lord, no, you don't understand. That's not the way we're going to do it, God. God says, that's the way it's done around here. (laughs) Now, if you notice here in verse 6, he says, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. In other words, the consolation and salvation that the Corinthian Christians received from Paul, that same consolation and salvation worked in the Corinthians, and it made them able to endure the same sufferings that Paul and the other apostles endured. So you got a cycle here. The suffering came into Paul's life. He received comfort. It made him more usable by God and more able to minister to others. He brought other people consolation and salvation. Then as they grew, as they matured in the Lord, God worked in them endurance to go through the same kind of sufferings that Paul went through. And it's just kind of that repetition and that multiplication that goes on in the Christian life. I think it's interesting that Paul talks here, if you notice the phrase here in verse 6, he talks about the same sufferings. And I scratch my head and I say, same sufferings? Paul, when have I had the same sufferings for you as you did? I mean, I've never been shipwrecked. I've never been uh, beaten. I've never been uh, stoned as uh, executed in this sense. I've never been in perils of waters or robbers of my own countrymen. Paul, what are you talking about? You see, that, it's not the point. It, the, the point isn't that we suffer in exactly the same way Paul did. Do you think any of these Corinthians could, could make a list just like Paul's? None of them probably could. Yet Paul could say that they're the same sufferings because the exact circumstances of the suffering aren't so important. No, the real, the real important is what God is doing about it. What God is doing in your life and in my life and in somebody else's life through the sufferings. You know, here, here's a, uh, someone over here and they're going through some great financial trouble. And there's someone over there, there's some great relationship problem going on in their life. And there's someone over there, great physical pain in their life. And, you know, we go, well, you know, their sufferings are all different. Boy, they can't relate to each other. Yes, they can. Their sufferings are very different, aren't they? But at the same time, they're the same. Jesus Christ wants to do the same thing in every one of them. He wants to be their consolation. And he wants them to come to trust him more and more alone in the midst of it all. Christians should never get into the the habit of, of a sort of a competition of comparing sufferings. You know, well, he's got it worse than them. And they've got it worse than them. And, oh, wow, they've got it worse than them. Although I will say that sometimes it is useful to compare our sufferings to the sufferings of others just to see how light our burden really is. When you hear about uh, Christians in the Muslim world right now oftentimes being literally crucified for Jesus Christ. Well, the, the, the fact that, you know, gee, I guess... Uh, Bible study falls on that night when the World Series game is, and I guess I can't go, well, Lord, I guess I'm suffering for you, Lord, because I can't see that World Series game. (laughs) Yeah, it just doesn't compare, does it? Besides, why do you think God gave you the VCR? So you tape it. (laughs) Doesn't doesn't matter at all, does it? You you start comparing your sufferings to those who are really suffering, and it's like, well, what are we going through? Friends, the The New Testament idea of suffering is broad. It's not limited to just one kind of affliction. You know, the Greek word for suffering, the the actual word there originally has the idea of physical pressure. It means to be under pressure, under stress. In the days of old medieval England, sometimes certain criminals, as a form of execution, what they would do is they would lay the criminal down on on the ground and they would put like a board or a sheet of almost like plywood over them. You know what they would do? They start piling on heavy weights upon the person until they were pressed to death. 
well, that's kind of pressing, that kind of pressure on you, that kind of, of pressure upon a person. That's the idea of suffering. You feel the stress, don't you? Feel the pressure. It could be coming from any number of fronts. But Paul says, God wants to do it. Use something in your life. And notice what he wants to develop in your life. Did you see that in verse 6? Which is effective for enduring the same sufferings. God's desire is that we would be enduring through suffering. You and I so often, we want the suffering removed. God, take it away. Take it away. That must be your answer for my suffering. And God says, no, my answer in this situation is not to take it away. My answer is for you to endure through it that word for endurance it's a wonderful wonderful word in the original language it isn't the idea of a passive bleak acceptance but of the kind of spirit that can triumph over pain and suffering to achieve the goal it's not the kind of person who you know can sit in a dentist chair and and you know endure it for a couple minutes or the marathon runner can gut it out over the long haul paul says that's what god wants to develop in you Now, thankfully, Paul also says at the end of verse 6, or if we are comforted, it is also for your consolation salvation. See, the sufferings in Paul's life wasn't just for the good of other people, but so was the consolation. God did not only work through the suffering Paul endured, God also worked the good things in the Corinthian Christians through the comfort Paul received from the Lord. And I just love this. You know, as I was reading this, I was thinking, look at where Paul's heart is. He says, you know, if I'm suffering, God can have something good for somebody else in the fact that I'm suffering. Paul says, if I'm comforted, God can have something good for somebody else in the fact that I'm comforted. You know, what just impresses me about this is that Paul is genuinely an others-centered person. You know, Paul's life is not focused on himself. His life is focused on the Lord and on those whom the Lord has given him to serve. Is Paul suffering? Well, it's so God can do something good for somebody else. Is Paul being uh, comforted? It's so God can bless the Corinthian Christians. The bottom line is suffering or comforted. It wasn't all about Paul. It was all about others. I think that gives us a good checkpoint in our life. Because some of us find it easy to be others-centered when we're comforted, when everything's going good, right? Right? Now, some people don't find it easy to be other-centered. Then that's when you're most self-centered. Everything's good. Then you're just keyed on yourself. Yeah, everything's great. You know. Now, when some trials come along, then you figure, well, I better get holy. I better get right with God. And then you start caring about other people. But for some people, they're more likely to be other-centered when they're suffering. Other people are more likely to be other-centered when they're comforted. God wants you to be it in both places. You know, one of the most helpful things you can ever do in your Christian life is just to adopt this spirit of the apostle paul and just say listen forget about me what can i go do for somebody else you, you might have walked in this room tonight so depressed so discouraged you may feel like the guy I was talking about before in medieval england you're being executed by stones just being pressed upon you feel that pressing on you the pressure's all around you you wonder what's going on can i just tell you, you want to get out from under that weight then just forget about yourself And and determine in your heart, you're not going to go to bed tonight until you've been a blessing to somebody else. That's all there is to it. You're just, that's that's it. You are not going to sleep tonight. If you have to, you're going to prowl the coffee shops tonight. And then you can find somebody you can bless or pray for. Because you're just not going to go to bed until you've blessed somebody. I tell you, God will do something good in your life through that. You suddenly realize that, that there's a change, that there's a difference. God never made you to be self-focused. That's why you're miserable. Oh, my friends, God has a purpose in all of it. It's to bring us to submission, to bring us low before him in a beautiful, tender way. So he concludes here in verse 7, that concludes this section. He says, and our hope for you is steadfast because we know that you are, as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will partake of the consolation. Isn't that great? Paul says, you know what? You guys are going to partake of the sufferings. I know that. I know it. But just as sure as he is of that, he says, you're also going to partake of the consolation. It's both, man. I can assure you of this, my friends. God has suffering appointed for you. And the second thing I'm just as sure is God has comfort appointed for you. Receive them both. I was reading a sermon by Charles Spurgeon today, and he was saying, 
you know, a lot of times we get ourselves into trouble in that we, we want to mull over our own sufferings. We want to meditate on them and concentrate and overanalyze them and just go over and over and think about them. He goes, you know, it's like when the, when the doctor gives you a pill to take. If you put it in your mouth and chew it up, it just tastes horrible. And, you know, it makes you feel bad all day. He goes, that's not how God wants you to handle this stuff. He doesn't want you to chew it up and keep it in your mouth and mull it around in your mouth. He goes, God gives you a pill, a bitter pill for you to so just swallow it. He says, and then it'll work. It'll, it'll do its work in your life and, and, and God will bless you from it. And just as much as God has that suffering appointed for you, he also has the consolation appointed. Now, Paul's going to talk a little bit more about his own suffering here. Look at verse 8. He says, for we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. You also helping together in prayer for us, that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. Paul begins these verses by describing the trouble that came to him in Asia. And we don't actually know what kind of trouble this was. Now, let's clarify one point. When he says Asia, he's not talking about China and Japan and Korea. That's Asia on our map. On the map of the ancient world, Asia talked about what today is modern day Turkey. So it's uh, you know, much different part of the world. But when Paul was in this region, he had some terrible, severe suffering. We don't know exactly what it was. It was probably either some type of persecution or physical affliction that was maybe made worse by his missionary work. And I could go through and tell you what all the Bible, well, it could have been this, it could have been that, but the bottom line, it doesn't even really matter. I want you to notice that whatever it was, it was bad. Did you see this here in verse 8? He says that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Whatever the problem was, Paul had to live with the anticipation of death. It's as if he felt he had a death sentence hanging over him, and that God had delivered him from so great a death. And because of the threat of death, Paul was just driven to despair. Now, you shouldn't think that this was necessarily persecution and that, you know, some Roman government official. So there's a death sentence on this man, because if you notice, he says here in verse nine, we had the sentence of death in ourselves. It wasn't somebody that somebody put on him externally. It was something that he just felt in himself. He said, I'm a condemned man. I'm doomed. There's no way I can get out of this. And then he realized that the only way that he could get out of it was to trust in God who raises the dead. Look at that in verse 9. It's powerful. He says, yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. God, there's no hope for me. It's like I'm a condemned man. It's like I'm on death row. It's like there's a death sentence on me, and I'm starting to walk that last walk. And I'm, I'm a dead man walking, Lord. There's no hope for me. God says, good, now you're getting the picture. That you should not trust in yourself. Well, then, Lord, what can I trust in? I'm a dead man. There's no hope for me. God says from heaven, you trust in the God who can raise the dead. Well, that makes, that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Yes, you are like a dead man. Yes, there is no place for trusting in you. And you know, it's just beautiful how the Bible just fits together so wonderfully. You know, isn't this exactly describing what Jesus meant when he said, If any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Why would you take up a cross in Jesus' day? Because it was a catchy evangelistic prop? No. Because it was a fashion statement? No. You know why you took up a cross in Jesus' day? Because you were going to be executed on it. It's like... If you lived in a culture where everybody was hanged, and before they hanged a person, they put a hood over his head. It's like Jesus is saying, if any man come after me, let him deny himself. Put that hood on his head and follow after me. Why would you put the hood on your head? Because you were going to die. And Jesus, count your life as gone. Count yourself as dead. Have no trust in yourself. But trust in God who raises the dead. Glorious thing, friends. 
And when Paul put his trust in God who raised his dead, look what God did, verse 10, who delivered us from so great a death. Yeah, Paul was delivered, wasn't he? Paul said, yeah, I'm delivered from it. But look, he goes on here. I love it. Verse 10, and does deliver us. He's not done yet. Look at verse 10 again. In whom we trust that he will still deliver us. Friends, that's salvation in three tenses right there. That's past, present, and future. He has delivered us. He is delivering us. And he will deliver us. The Bible says that you have been saved, that you're being saved, and that you will be saved. Now, you should be able to have all three of the tenses of salvation at work in your life right now. All three of them. You should be able to right now look at your life and say, you know what? I have been saved. I have been delivered. I see it. I see God's work in my life. And then you should also be able to look at your life right now and say, I am being delivered. I see it. I see. I see what God's doing in my life right now, today, this Wednesday in October. I know that God's working in my life. And then you should be able to look with just faithful anticipation at the future. You know what? I trust that I shall be delivered. That God's going to keep working in my life. And I'll tell you, right now, tonight, the devil wants to rob you of at least one of those three tenses. He wants to make you doubt what God has done or is doing or may do. And friends, don't let the devil rip that off from you. God wants your salvation to be in all three tenses, past, present, and future. And I think it's amazing, though, we talk about how God delivers. Look at verse 11. He says, you also helping together in prayer for us that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through the many. Friends, can I just kind of paraphrase that for you? Paul's saying, you Corinthians helped me through my time of suffering by your prayers. Look at it again in verse 11. You also helping together. How? How did the Corinthians help? In prayer for us. And then he says that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf. In other words, many people were thanking because they were part of the answer to prayer. And the gift was granted to us through many. Friends, Paul believed in the power of prayer. Paul knew that blessing and ministry was granted to him through many. That is, through the prayers of many people, God blessed the ministry of Paul. You know, I meditated on this this week, and it kind of blew my mind. We take a step back, and we think of the amazing ministry of the Apostle Paul. Friends, I don't know if there's ever been a mightier man of God who's ever walked this earth than the Apostle Paul. I mean, how do you compare such a thing? But truly, he's a giant. There's no doubt about it. It's very easy in my heart and in my mind. Paul, what a glorious man. What a great man. What an incredible man. You know what? If you were to talk about that to Paul, he'd say, well, listen, I'll tell you one reason why God's used me. It's because people prayed for me. That's what Paul would tell you. We think of all the great things that God did through Paul, and we rightly admire him as a man of God. But do we think of all the people who prayed for him? Paul credited them with much of his effectiveness in ministry. Friends, do you want to see God do more through his ministers? Pray for them. Dedicate yourself to it. That's what answered it in Paul's life. Who knows how many more Apostle Paul's God would raise up if people would pray. Now, kind of been a glorious passage up till verse 11, right? Paul talking about this comfort and this consolation and God's work and God's deliverance, past, present, and future and prayer. It's just sort of a great big love fest. Now, we kind of come to verse 12 now and we don't change it radically. I mean, just wait till we get in the latter chapters of this book. But Paul is kind of changing his focus when he comes to verse 12 because Paul has to defend his ministry. You'll get the idea as we carry on here. Verse 12. For our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God and more abundantly towards you. For we are not writing any other things to you than what you read or understand. Now I trust that you will understand even to the end, as you also have understood us in, in part, that we are your boast as you also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. Paul starts off these verses by talking about the testimony of his conscience. 
In this section, from now till the end of the chapter, Paul is going to be defending himself against some accusations. The accusations basically centered around the the idea that Paul was fickle and unreliable. That he would say, well, I'm going to come visit you guys. Yeah, I really want to come visit you. And then he wouldn't show up. Or he'd show up at a time he didn't say he would show up. And Paul starts off this section saying, I want you guys to know something from the outset. I have a clear conscience before God. And I trust you're going to understand that is what Paul says. Matter of fact, Paul says, if you notice this in verse 12, he says, We conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom. The Corinthian Christians were so used to dealing with ministers who were calculating and manipulative that they figured Paul must be the same way. Therefore, when Paul said that he was going to come to them, by the way, he said that in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, It's on the same page as in my Bible. Take a look at 1 Corinthians 16.5. Paul wrote in the first letter, Now I will come to you when I pass through Macedonia, for I am passing through Macedonia. I mean, that's pretty straightforward, right? Paul says, I'm going to come to you guys when I pass through your area. But you see, because the Corinthian Christians were so used to uh, calculating and manipulative kind of people, they figured that, Paul was just manipulating them. Paul says, no. What I said, I said it in simplicity. I said it in godly sincerity. And friends, I think there was a problem among the Corinthian Christians. I think it's a problem we really face in our culture today. It's a problem of being cynical. You know what it means to be cynical? Well, let me put it to you this way. You got a cup of water and it's half filled with water. The optimist says it's half full. The pessimist says it's half empty. The cynic says the water's poison. (laughs) That's kind of the idea of being a cynic. You just kind of go around figuring nobody's honest. Everybody has bad motives. Everyone is out for personal gain and power. You can't trust anybody. Now, it's amazing how cynical we become in the United States of America, especially when it comes to politics, right? I mean, people don't expect anything from politicians except the most dishonest, unethical, immoral kind of behavior. We just say, well, you know what we say during campaigns? You say, well, of course they're lying. They're politicians. I mean, that's what we say. The politicians in the campaigns, they make these grandiose promises during the campaigns, right? They know they're lying. We know they're lying. Everybody knows they're lying, but it's just kind of accepted because we become so cynical. It's like, it's a nobody. well, that's not true. You're not going to do that when you get to Congress. Now, Paul had to deal with this cynical attitude among the Corinthians. They didn't trust Paul because they were cynical. And so Paul has to explain to them, he says, listen, I'm not writing to you any other things to you than what you read or understand. Paul wanted the Corinthian Christians to know, hey, there's no hidden meanings in my letters. My meanings are right out on top for all to see. That's what happens when you're cynical, right? Somebody says, well, good morning to you. And you think, what did they really mean by that? (laughs) The politician says, "Uh, I plan to do this and that. And the, the cynic says, Well, what does he really mean by that? He can't mean what he's really saying because his motives can't be honest. His motives can't be true. And this is what the Corinthians were thinking of Paul. And Paul has to protest. He says, listen, there's no hidden meanings. You don't have to read between the lines. When I write you a letter, I mean what I say. That cynical heart will always think, you say this, but you really mean that because you're not telling the truth. But Paul assured the Corinthian Christians he was really telling the truth and he wasn't communicating with manipulative hidden meanings. William Barclay said, in Paul's life, there were no hidden actions, no hidden motives, and no hidden meanings. There it is, just right out front. Now he continues on here in verse 15. He says, and in this confidence, I intended to come to you before that you might have a second benefit. To pass by way of you to Macedonia, to come again from Macedonia to you, and to be helped by you on my way to Judea. Therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly? Or the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh that with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no? You see, Paul's saying, look, I intended to come to you before. 
The Corinthian Christians were accusing Paul of being unreliable and untrustworthy because he said he would be there at a certain time and he was not. You know what he did instead? He sent a letter. And the Corinthians, who were kind of inclined to disrespect Paul anyway, they got his letter and he goes, if he really loved us, he'd be here instead of sending this letter. Come on. And maybe we should just go over a little chronology here of what happened. Paul wrote the letter of 1 Corinthians. And in the letter of 1 Corinthians, he promised to see the Corinthians on his way to Macedonia. Maybe it's too harsh to say he promised. Let's just say he declared his intention to go and see them on his way to Macedonia. Well, he changed his plans. And he decided to see them first on his way to Macedonia. And then again on his way back to give them what he calls in verse 5 here, or verse 15, a second benefit. So Paul did see them in between First and Second Corinthians. But when Paul made the first visit on the way to Macedonia, it was painful for both him and the Corinthians. Why? Well, because they were messed up and Paul had to, you know, whip them into shape. He had to crack the whip on them. And there were a lot of hurt feelings. because Paul had to get in the face of some people. Matter of fact, if you want an idea here of what this meeting was like, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. We'll get into it next week in more uh, detail. But he says, I determined this within myself that I would not come again to you in sorrow. In other words, the last time Paul had with them, it, it wasn't a pretty sight, Paul there with the Corinthians. He had to really confront them. He had to really be upfront with them. And, and well, God did some good things through it, but it wasn't pleasant. Now, at some time after this visit, Paul, or perhaps maybe one of his representatives there, was openly insulted in Corinth by someone who was against him, maybe of this anti-Paul party that was there. We'll talk more about this next week. Now, because the first visit was so unpleasant, and because Paul saw that there was no benefit in going back again personally, Paul decided not to come back again and see the Corinthians. And therefore... He sent this letter, not this letter. He sent a letter in between first and second Corinthians. I hope you're not getting too confused by this, but please understand that there was a letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church in between first and second Corinthians. Uh, some people call this the severe letter because it apparently was pretty strong again. Now, Paul had this and he sent it there. And, and then when Paul went to Macedonia, he uh, was there in Macedonia and he heard about the Corinthians' reaction to his severe letter. That's what prompted him to write this letter. And he's saying, listen, listen, guys, I intended to come by you. We thought it would be good. But he says, when I was planning this, look at this in verse 17. Did I do it lightly? The Corinthians were accusing Paul of being fickle, and they were insisting, well, if he was a man of integrity, he would have come in person. Paul's change in plans made the Corinthian Christians say that Paul must be a man who, when he says yes, he means no, and when he says no, he means yes. Can you imagine somebody standing up? I can just imagine somebody. They wouldn't do it at church during the service. You know, the, the preacher wouldn't get up there and say, well, I decry the Apostle Paul. No, you know how this would be done. It would be done at the donut table after, after church, right? Some, well, you know, that Paul, gosh, you know, when he says yes, he must mean no. And when he says no, I guess he means yes. You can't trust the guy. He said he would be here. And where is he? Oh, that Paul. So he was being criticized as a man who couldn't decide on a plan or couldn't carry through on a plan. And his enemies among the Christians in Corinth seized on these circumstances to make him look bad. Now, can I just be straight with you here? Was it wrong for the Corinthian Christians to be disappointed that Paul couldn't be there? No, that's not wrong. They, you know, who wouldn't want the Apostle Paul to come? And so if Paul says, hey, I'm coming, and then he says, oh, I can't, we'd be disappointed. You know, think of a guest speaker that we love to have. Think of a guy like Gail Irwin. You know, oh, Gail says, hey, guess what? I can come out on this particular Sunday. And we go, oh, great, man, that's fantastic. And then Gail has to call back two weeks later. And he goes, oh, you know what? My schedule got messed up and I just can't make it. Now, it would be right for us to be disappointed. Oh, Gail can't come. It would be wrong for us to do what the Corinthians did and try to blame 
somebody for the disappointment. You know, if he really loved us, he'd be here. I wonder what the real reason is. Maybe he's a coward. You know, matter of fact, I told the Apostle Paul, the next time he sees me, he's going to hear from me. I bet he's not coming because he's afraid to confront me. You know, this kind of talk was going around the Corinthian church. And Paul says, listen, you guys don't understand it all. Matter of fact, Lotus says he goes on here in verse 18. He says, but as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no. Isn't that great? Paul says, listen, just as much as God is faithful, I'm telling you right now, so we are faithful in what we said to you. As much as God is true to his promises, God has taught me to be true to mine. He says, our word to you is not yes and no. Paul says, when I say yes, I don't mean no. When I say yes, I mean yes. He goes on here, verse 19. He says, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is preached among you by me, or excuse me, by us, by me, Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes, for all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him amen to the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us as God, who has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a deposit. Now in these verses, Paul is giving them the spiritual reasons why they were wrong in, his estima in their estimation of him. The first thing he says, listen, you know what? I'll tell you why I'm not a yes means no and no means yes kind of guy. Because the God I serve isn't like that. Paul says, Jesus Christ, everything and yes is yes in him and everything that's no is no in him. And if I preach a Jesus who is completely reliable and worthy of trust, why are you so quick to accuse me of being unreliable and unworthy of trust? Matter of fact, he goes on there and you saw this great verse here, didn't you? Verse 20. You saw that, didn't you? For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen. Isn't that fantastic? Every promise of God to you in Jesus Christ, you know what God says about it? Yes. You know what it all says about it? He says, amen to him in you. That's what all the promises are. Friends, can you ever imagine God the Father saying no to God the Son? It's just not going to happen. It is not going to happen. God the Father will always say yes to the Son and will always affirm what the Son says. He'll always say amen to what the Son says. Now, let me cheer your heart with something right now. God the Father is never going to say no to God the Son, is he? Do you know God the Son is praying for you right now in heaven? He ever lives to make intercession for you. There might not be another person on this earth praying for you, though there probably is, right? But let's say there's not. Let's say nobody else on this earth is praying for you. Jesus Christ is praying for you from heaven right now. Let me tell you, God the Father is answering all his prayers too. All of them. Everything in Christ is yes. Everything the Son says is amen. You know what I think about this? What a precious verse. I think through the centuries, through the thousands of years that, that the church has been on this earth and that we've had these writings from the New Testament. I think about all the years that people have read the Bible and have circled this verse and have memorized it and had this precious verse mean something to their heart. And I say, thank you, Jesus, for the trials that Paul went through with the people of Corinth. If Paul would have never gone through these trials with the people of Corinth, he would have never wrote this verse. If he would have never wrote this verse, I'd never have this precious promise to cheer my heart. And I say, yeah, Lord, now I see how the consolation that you brought Paul in his time of suffering consoles me and brings salvation to me. And so he goes on and he says, look, I love this. In verse 21, he who establishes us is with you and Christ and he who anointed us is God. And he who has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a deposit. Paul refers to three aspects of the spirit's work here. He says he's anointed us. He's sealed us, and he's put a deposit on us. He is our deposit. You know why somebody would be anointed in the Bible? Not so they could fall down. Not so they could do things in front of a big uh, auditorium. In the Bible, people are anointed for service, to be able to serve God. They're set apart to serve. You know, and that's an anointing we all have. The Bible never talks about an anointing in a New Testament sense as something that's set aside just for a few Christian superstars. We all have an anointing. You can be anointed by God for service. That's not the only thing we have. We're also sealed. Do you know why you would seal something in the ancient world? You would seal it to identify it and to protect it. 
you know, you'd put that wax on there and you'd put a seal on it. Everybody would know the insignia on that seal. That's who this belonged to. And then it would also protect it because the seal would make sure that the thing wasn't tampered with. God has put the Holy Spirit in your life to identify you and to protect you. And then he's done another thing with the Holy Spirit. He's giving you the Holy Spirit as a deposit. You know what that means? It means you're on the layaway plan, my friends. God's put down that down payment on you. And he's making the payments. And let me tell you, if you go put that down, if you put an expensive down payment on something, you're going to come through with the cash and complete the transaction, aren't you? You're not going to walk away from it if you put down a big down payment. Has God put down a big down payment on you? He's not walking away from that transaction, friends. You're on the layaway plan. And God's doing this work in your life. Let's wrap it up here, verse 23 and 24. Paul's going to give the personal reasons why their accusations are wrong. He says, moreover, I call God as witness against my soul that to spare you, I came no more to Corinth. Not that we have dominion over your faith, but our fellow workers for your joy, for by faith you stand. Paul's pretty serious here in verse 23, don't you think? I call God as witness against my soul. That's a heavy thing. That's pretty dead serious for the Apostle Paul. He says, let me tell you guys why I really didn't come to Corinth to spare you. Now, it's the way of a cynic to always think the worst of somebody else and to assume, as the Corinthians did of Paul, that the reason why he didn't come to Corinth was a selfish reason. Paul, you're chicken. It's inconvenient. You don't really love us. Whatever. You know why Paul says, no. You know why I didn't come? To spare you. Paul's setting him straight. It's out of concern for you that I didn't come. Paul's probably thinking, you guys made me so furious that I would have ripped the arm off of one of you and beaten you over the head with it until you collapsed. Believe me, it was to spare you that kind of ugliness that I didn't come to Corinth. Believe me, Paul's probably saying, you don't know how good you had it that I didn't come. No, my friends. Notice how Paul concludes here in verse 24. Not that we have dominion over your faith, but are fellow workers for your joy, for by faith you stand. My friends, in Jesus Christ... No one has dominion over your faith. The Apostle Paul would not take the place of a man or a woman's conscience before God. He would say, you are accountable before God. I don't have dominion over your faith. And friends, let me tell you, no council, no conclave, no uh, group of people, no congress, no club, no church body in and of itself has power over your conscience, but only Jesus Christ alone. It's before him that you stand and fall. And it's a serious thing for us to take to heart, my friends. Because you can't stand before somebody else and say, well, you know, it's their fault. You've got a Bible right in front of you, don't you? If I'm not teaching you the truth, you should find it out. And God will show you. God will show you what his truth is if you'll be a Berean and search the scriptures for yourself. My friend, there's said to be three things that God has reserved unto himself and has not given man any power to do. The first one of those things is to create out of nothing. Man can never do that. The other thing that is to know the future, and man cannot know that unless God reveals it to him. And the third thing is to have dominion over another man's conscience. We all stand and fall before God, and you know, that gives us all the more responsibility to come and to seek the Lord together. Say, Lord, I want to yield my conscience, my heart before you. You rule over my soul. We love that song, don't you? Do you remember that song? Rule over my soul. Rule over my soul. Sweet spirit, rule over my soul. My rest is complete as I sit at your feet. Sweet spirit, rule over my soul. 
And friends, you may find people in your days as you walk this earth who desire to rule over your soul. Don't let them. And you may find people, and you may be in this category, who want somebody to rule over their soul. God and God alone answers your conscience. Friends, if the Apostle Paul wouldn't take dominion over another man's faith or conscience, far be it from me to do it. Instead, let's give all things to God and seek Him as individuals before Him. And next week, as we get into chapter 2, wow. Remember uh, when Paul in 1 Corinthians had to kind of get in the face of those crazy Corinthians because there was a guy committing horrible sexual immorality and the church wasn't doing anything about it? Well, whatever happened to that guy? Well, we'll find out next week in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Friends, take it with you. Take it with you that God wants to do a work in your life in three tenses, past, present, and future. Let him complete that work. Let's come before him right now. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you seeking you tonight, we simply ask that you would rule over our souls, Lord. We know that you love us. We know that you care for us. But Lord, we want you to have dominion over our souls. Father, I pray right now uh, for anybody here tonight who has given dominion over their faith to some other person. Or maybe they themselves have taken dominion over their faith. Lord, you never intended to rule. You never intended for us to rule over our own souls. Lord, that's a work that you want to do in our lives. And we trust that you will do it as we yield to you.